Well, good morning again. If you would open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. I'm not quite sure what they put in the water in Australia, but anybody that can sing and play drums at the same time and throw an axe is worthy of some manly respect, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Jesse, great to hear from you this morning, man. Thank you for serving us. Um, I'm looking forward to this passage in Philippians for my own soul, but also because it gives me an opportunity to express the deep affection that I have, that we have as pastors for you. I trust you'll understand why when we, when we read the passage, but I, I wanted to introduce it by saying I'm so grateful that God's Word gives us vocabulary for how we are to feel toward one another. We don't have to ask that question. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to look it up somewhere else. It's, it's right here in God's Word. The kind of disposition Christians are to have toward fellow Christians, toward fellow partners in grace. Paul models this for us in verses 6 and 7 of his opening sentence. This is a long sentence that he just tumbles over himself to thank and express gratefulness and joy and affection to them. It's almost as though he can't get into the letter without bursting with his joyful, grateful affection for these people. And we're going to read one more section of his opening song this morning. Let's begin reading in verse, chapter, in verse uh, 7 of chapter 1 of Philippians. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. One of my wife's favorite things about Christmas is stockings. The stockings that you hang over the fireplace, if you have one, or on some kind of mantle uh, in your house. She loves stockings. Actually, I think she loves stockings more than regular presents. Uh, that's what she gets excited about. She loves finding little treasures, uh, little kind of ideas for the kids that she can put in there. And over the course of, of really the second half of the year, because my wife is an organized individual, uh, she's finding these, these little treasures that she can't wait to put in the stocking. So by the time Christmas morning comes around, uh, these stockings are overflowing with these little treasures, these fun little games and, and toys and stuff that she's found for them just to fit their personality. It's, it's almost a picture, I think, the stockings on Sunday morning of her heart towards our children. There's this sense where it's just overflowing. They don't fit all in, so you have to kind of let them fall out the top, and they're coming from the side. Just these little things that she's found over the course of the years. She's so excited to give them. There's this, there's this abundance. There's a sort of an overflowing nature to it. There's a sense that you can't, you can't fit it in some kind of confined space. And it reminds me of Paul. In these verses, as, as he brings his declaration of gratefulness to somewhat of a temporary, at least, conclusion, he's going to move on to the, the prayer that he has for them in the very next verse. But there's this sense of abundance, isn't there? There's a sort of an overflowing nature to what Paul is saying. It's almost as though he, he can't get enough words out to express his feeling towards them. And it, it's motivating for us. Paul's affection, Paul's gratefulness, his joy in these believers, these Philippians, is intended to motivate us. It's intended to encourage the Philippian church. You can imagine when the Philippians received this, how encouraged they were of Paul's abundant affection for them. Something like a child, spiritually speaking, coming down and, and finding a stocking, just overflowing with the intentional, thoughtful gratefulness of their parent. The Philippians hear these phrases kind of overflowing from Paul to convince them of his grateful, joyful affection for them in Christ Jesus. 
And it's instructive for us. It's intended to model for us what it should be from one Christian to another, from one Christian heart to another, to our partners in Christ. Grateful affection should fill our hearts towards our partners in Christ. I think that's the the claim or the model that is presented to us. Grateful affection should fill our hearts towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, towards our partners in Christ, as Paul would call the Philippian church. Now, he he basically breaks up these two verses. You could break them up in, in two main sections. The first one's a bit longer. You might call them affection explained and then affection proclaimed. All right, so those are our two points this morning. Affection explained, because in verse 7, he's basically explaining... He's defending this abundance of affection that's poured out of him. You almost might imagine that the child, when they come down, looking at that stocking and saying, wow, what, why, why all of this? this? This is a lot. Why did you do all of this? Well, Paul is answering that objection in verse 7. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why all of this affection. So he's explaining it. And then in verse 8, he puts an exclamation point on it, and he sort of proclaims it with God as his witness. So affection explained, and then affection proclaimed. Let's, let's walk into affection explained first of all. Notice he says in verse 7, It is right for me to feel this way about you all. It is right, he says. So he's almost on the defensive. He's explaining himself. That word right, it it, it means it is appropriate. It is the right thing to do. It is correct. It is is right for me. And the word feel there, to feel a certain way, it's not just a sentimentality word. That word feeling, it's the same word that we might think of when we think of mindset or perspective or, or disposition. It's not just emotional. It, it, it encompasses the idea of, of perspective. So when he's saying it, it is right for me to have this perspective, and we remember verses 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, his perspective is one of overwhelming joy and gratefulness and confidence for all of them. He's saying it's right for me to have this perspective of overwhelming gratefulness and confidence and joy. It's right for me to have this perspective. And then he gives a couple of reasons. Now, we, we want to feel the effect of this word. It is right for me to feel this way. Because again, this is Paul setting an example. This is Paul being a model for us. And in case you have any hesitation about using Paul as a model, let me just read from this book, Philippians 4, uh, 9. Paul says this to the Philippian church and thereby says it to us as well. Philippians 4, 9, you can turn over one page if you want to or I'll read it to you. It says this, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And you might want to notice, it's it's interesting, in that uh, verse, verse uh, 4-9, that's following the well-known passage where Paul talks about what we should be thinking about, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. That's one of those pillow verses or magnet verses, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure. Think about these things. And then he says in verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. So what Paul's perspective is, is that God has called them to be an example, a model of what the gospel should do in an individual. A model such that his behavior was intended by God to be a a pattern for believers. Now, we do not imitate Paul in his authority or his role in writing scripture that is unique to him and unrepeatable. But in terms of his Christian character... Part of the reason he displays himself in these ways is that God had called him to be a model for the church. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. He was supposed to represent the effect of the gospel in the life of an individual. So he says, what you have seen and heard in me, practice these things. Certainly we should include his affection, his abundant affection displayed in verses 3 through 7 of chapter 1. This affection is intended to motivate us. So when Paul says, it is right for me to feel this way, we should take, it is right for me to feel this way as well. 
This is the proper way to feel, the appropriate way to feel, to, to have a perspective towards fellow Christians, partners in Christ. This is the appropriate perspective to have. We need to feel that motivate us. That's the claim of this passage. We should have abundant, grateful affection for fellow Christians. That should be what comes out of our hearts. Here's the claim of it. Paul's affection is meant to motivate us. It's meant to encourage us. It's meant to inspire us. It's meant to be, it's meant to be a model for us. It's meant to be a model for you. It's right for me to feel this way about you. And then he gives a couple of reasons. He continues his explanation. This is affection explained. Why is it right that I feel this way about you? He says to the Philippians. Why is it right? Well, he gives a couple of reasons. It's right, first of all, because I hold you in my heart. I hold you in my heart. The first reason that it's right for him to feel abundant gratefulness is that the Philippian believers were united deep in Paul's heart. They were connected to him. They were a treasure to him. They were central to who he was. When Paul thought of himself, he thought of himself in union, in, in connection, in, in joined participation with these Philippian believers, these fellow partners in Christ. They were in his heart. What, what he's basically answering is, uh, is this just a moment of, uh, you had too much caffeine, Paul? I mean, uh, Paul's always answering these kinds of objections, unspoken. Are you just kind of bubbly, and this is just your bubbly personality? And he's saying, no, it's right for me to feel this way because I always hold you in my heart. Someone that you hold deeply in your heart that you have connected to the, the deepest part of your loves and your, your passions and your desires, of course you are excited to see God's grace present in their life. Now, we do this naturally with our, our kind of natural relationships. So let, let's say, for example, that you have a spouse that, that gets good news from the doctor, that, look, it, it's not as bad as they thought it was. What happens to your heart right there? Well, it, it's, it's grateful, it's joyful, it's, it's, it's celebrating. Why? Why is that emotion coming out? Well, because you hold them in your heart. What happens to them affects you. What happens to a parent when a, when a child finally, finally connects with that ball on the tee and it actually goes somewhere? What happens to that parent? Well, you're excited. Why are you excited? Because you hold them in your heart. You understand what Paul is saying? The reason I'm excited and grateful and joyful is because of your place in my heart. That's the first reason. The second reason is that you are all partakers with me. Wonderful phrase there in the Greek. It's, it's, a, it's a fellow receiver, a fellow partner of grace. You're fellows with me. You're partnered with me in receiving the grace of God. So he's saying, this is, this is why I'm so abundantly grateful. Here's why you came down in that morning and there was just an overflow of gratefulness and abundance and love towards you. Here's why. First of all, I hold you in my heart. And now let me build on that. Why do I hold you in my heart? Because you have received the same grace I have received. We, we have been mutually rescued by the grace of God. God has been favorable towards us. He has loved us in an undeserving way. And I see that same favor of God towards you that I have received. We have received it together. So Paul backs up and says, well, the reason I'm excited for you is because both of us came down on a metaphorical Christmas morning and saw that God has abundantly blessed us in an undeserved way through salvation. We shared in the experience of God's grace in Christ. We are partner receivers of grace. And that's why I hold you in my heart. And holding you in my heart, of course, I rejoice to see the additional grace God continues to pour out in your life. Not only are you partakers with me of grace, you receive that grace in some very specific context. You are recipients of grace with me. We are partners in God's grace, both in my imprisonment 
and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Remember, he's, he's explaining his affection, and Paul always kind of builds phrases on top of each other. How would I explain this affection? Why is it right that I feel this way? Well, first of all, I hold you in my heart, first of all. You're, you are there. Anything that happens to you is going to affect me. I hold you in my heart. And I hold you in my heart because we are fellow receivers of grace. You and I have received the amazing grace of God. And this grace of God has been given to us in such a way that you are united with me in my imprisonment even and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. We find out later in the book that the Philippians had sent a financial gift to support and help Paul. We get the impression that they cared deeply about him in his ministry, that they wanted to sacrifice to serve and, and bless him and benefit him. They were united to him in grace, even in a ministry that brought about suffering. This, this reception of grace, this, this identity, this partnership, is not one that is, is only present in the good times. It's present even when Paul is in prison. It's present when Paul is proclaiming the gospel fearlessly to his Roman guards. It's present even when he thinks about them in Philippi also standing up for the gospel in the face of opposition. Paul views them as united recipients of a grace that endures standing for Christ even in the face of suffering. He's saying, you're with me in this. We're together in this. We are going in the same direction, facing the same difficulties. And it is as if Paul is saying, by the grace of God, you are with me in spirit, even in my jail cell. You are with me, even as I am, I am preaching to a crowd on the other side of the Mediterranean. You are with me, even when I am receiving the condemnation of my fellow Jews. You are with me because you have received God's grace. Together, we have received grace. And I experience your union, even in my most painful, difficult circumstances. I, I think it's fascinating to look at this passage in terms of the, the word in. Notice that in verse 7, it says, I hold you in my heart for, because you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment. Notice the word in there. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Notice the double use of the word in. So what he's saying, he's saying, I have you in my heart and you are recipients of grace with me in my imprisonment. We are in this together. You notice how Paul's saying that? You're in my heart, and you're with me, a recipient of grace, in my imprisonment, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. It's almost as though we can't get away from each other even if we wanted to. We're, we're together in this. We are united in this. We're, we're in each other's condition. Paul's explaining his affection. He's saying, let, let me explain why it's right that I love you and I am grateful for you because you have received God's grace and that causes you to be held dearly in my heart. You are a fellow recipient of the grace of God and that grace has positioned you so that you are partners with me even in my imprisonment. You're not ashamed of me. You're not looking to disown me. You're not looking to distance yourself from me. You're not looking to protect yourself at my expense. You, you, are, you are partnered with me even in this most shameful and difficult of circumstances, even in the risky moment of proclaiming the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to a culture that worships Caesar. You're with me in that, and I am so gratefully affectionate towards you because of that. Now, there, there's a, almost a, a double motivation here, isn't there? Don't you want to be like the Philippians, a participant in grace that endures even the imprisonment of your friends and is with them even in their risky proclamation of the gospel? Don't you, don't you want to be someone who could also produce this kind of affection from someone else? I mean, I do. There, there's something, I think, in our culture that loyalty and partnership and fellowship, it's good to a point until it starts to cost you something. I think we, we, we value at certain times our, our independence 
And as long as our independence isn't threatened or our own safety isn't threatened, we'll, we'll stand with someone. But if, if they begin to experience shame or, or persecution or difficulty, well, then it's, it's easy to kind of distance yourself from them. What, what Paul's saying is, I love you because the grace of God that we have received has caused you to be with me even in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. You gladly stand with me in spirit. You'll gladly send one of your own to come help me. You sacrifice to support me. You are with me in this. And Paul says, that's why I love you so much. I am so grateful for you. That's why I hold you in my heart. Because I see an amazing evidence of the grace of God. Now, it is the grace of God. This isn't some uh, superior steadfastness on the part of the Philippians. It's not as though he's celebrating their individual loyalty and saying, good for you, you're better than the rest. No, he, he's saying God has done something in us that is solely owing to his sovereign kindness, but I'm so grateful for you as the means of God revealing his grace in these ways. Seeing the grace of God in you, especially in the midst of my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, it causes me so much joyful affection. I love you because you are the means, the instrument of God's grace being displayed in this partnership that takes place even in the midst of suffering. Now, brothers and sisters, let, let me press this example of the Philippians to us. Let us be prepared to stand with brothers and sisters, partners in Christ, even when they face suffering and difficulty in their ministry. Let us be willing to stand with Christians when they are going through a trial and seeking to endure that trial with patience and faithfulness in the Lord. Let's, let's gladly stand with them so that we can be the cause of this kind of celebration and affection. When, when that happens in this church, let's imagine that there's a brother who is in a particular industry that the laws change and they shift and adjust, and, and his conscience is such that he cannot continue in his position and hold true to his Christian convictions, and, and suddenly he's out of a job. Let's, let's imagine a sister who likewise is, has always done this service in the community or served in this business in the community. Well, then the, the laws change or the business changes and there's an expectation of acting in a certain way and, and they're no longer able to do it freely and they're out of a job or they're demoted or they're frowned upon or they have to live a, a far more reduced standard of living. That is a moment for our affection and our love and our loyal partnership to be displayed that we're united in the grace of God that we've received and we gladly stand with those who are standing with Christ. We, we could think of, of people who serve the Lord overseas and in places where there's physical danger. There's places, and you know this, in the world where to stand for Jesus at all means that you face immediate physical danger, financial danger, economic danger, social danger, familial danger. You face those kinds of dangers. It should be our desire to stand with those that are standing with Christ because we are the fellow recipients of grace with them and we are with them in heart and spirit in the midst of their difficulty because we have received the grace of God. And the most defining thing about us is not our desire for comfort and stature and the preservation of some political power, but the revelation of the grace of God that has come to us and to them and that that identity motivates us to love them and care for them and to receive from them and give to them the affection that is given to those who are one with us in Christ. I hold you in my heart, he says. I hold you in my heart because you are a partner with me of God's grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Let, let's, let's ask a very, very important question. Is there anything in your life that you want more or would rather hold on to than connecting and identifying with a fellow believer in their suffering. Let's cast it aside. 
because we want to be the recipients of this kind of affection and we want to give this kind of affection to those who are also our partners in Christ. We want to be this kind of affectionate fellow believer as well. Paul says, this is why I'm affectionate. And then he exclaims it. He proclaims it with an oath. Notice that in verse 8. So affection explained is verse 7. And then affection proclaimed in verse 8. Notice he says, for God is my witness. How I yearn for you all. Listen to this amazing phrase. With the affection of Christ Jesus. This is the exclamation point at the end of this, this declaration. He's explained it. Now he's going to exclaim it with God as a witness. He, he basically puts himself under oath before God himself, he says. For God is my witness. Let me tell you the scope, the degree, the extent to which I will declare my affection for you. God is my witness. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Here, you have to realize how seriously Paul is taking this declaration of affection. Paul does not view affection as an optional extra for the Christian. He does not want the Philippians to be in any doubt about the degree of grateful affection and joy that he has towards them. It is so important to him that he calls God himself to the witness stand to bear witness that this is true. He's willing for God himself to denounce him as a liar if it is not accurate that in the innermost part of his being he yearns for them with the affection of Christ Jesus. He's saying, I, I, I'm willing for God to denounce me as a liar if this is not true. So certain am I of, of the depth of my affection for you, the, the, the passion with which I hold you with joyful affection, that I call God to the witness stand and I say, he can denounce me as a liar if this is not true. It's an exclamation point. I yearn for you. I think that's true probably of him seeing them again. I think there's probably some, some spiritual components as well. I, I yearn for your well-being in Christ, your progress in the faith. We get that when we read the very next verse. So it's likely that he both yearns to see them and also yearns for, for Christ to continue to be formed in them, for the grace of God to be displayed in them, for them to grow in their unity, in their love for the Lord, in their expressions of defending the gospel. He, he yearns for them. There is a, a heart pull towards these believers that he's willing God to attest to and notice this final phrase. How does he define this affection? It's the affection of Christ Jesus. What type of affection does Paul have? The very affection of Christ Jesus is what he's calling God to attest to. Now, this is a, this is a dangerous thing to do if it's not true. Think about what he just said. I call God as my witness. God can denounce me a liar if the affection I have for you is not the same affection of Christ Jesus for you. Now, what kind of a standard does that bring to us? I call God as my witness. This is not self-flattery. This is not an exaggerated view of how loving I am. This is not a husband remembering wrongly how many gifts he gave his wife last Valentine's Day. This, this is not that situation. This is a man who is willing to put his reputation before God on the line to declare, I yearn for you, not with any kind of affection, but with the affection of Christ Jesus. What does this mean? It means Paul believes that the very affection of Christ for his blood-bought people should flow out of Paul to the Philippian church. And since, as we read in 4.9, Paul says, whatever you have seen and heard and learned and received in me, practice these things, we can assume Paul also expects other Christians to be able to say, God is my witness how I yearn for you, not just with a temporary human kind of affection, but with the very affection of Christ. Christ's view of you, his love for you, flows out of my heart towards you.
Now, how are we to apply this? How are we to ascribe to this? Well, first of all, let me just take a pause and speak to you. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, you cannot love people the way the Lord Jesus does. So if you're here, and maybe you're here because your parents are here, or you're here as a guest, or we're so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. But I just want to make it clear. You can't love people like this unless you have known the love of the Lord Jesus in forgiving your sins, in giving you mercy in the place of judgment, in promising you eternal life, in comforting you with his, his presence and his word. And unless you've cast aside the, the false kind of loves that are present in this world, the love of self and the love of money and the love of reputation, if you've cast those aside and you've found in Jesus the love that can satisfy your soul and that pays for your sins, only there can you learn to love other people this way. So let me encourage you, if you're here and you're not a Christian, let me invite you to know the love of Jesus. You can repent of your sins. You can turn to Jesus as your Savior. You can receive his love for you in salvation. And then you can reflect that love little by little towards those other believers who have also received the same grace. For the rest of us as Christians, let me encourage you, we are called to a, an abundant, grateful affection towards fellow believers in Christ. We are called to this. This is our delightful responsibility. It, it is our privilege. It is the task that God has given us. Jesus said by this man, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And Paul is a model of the kind of grateful, abundant affection that we have towards those who stand with us in the faith, whatever our circumstances, who agree with us that we have mutually received the grace of God. Now, how do we cultivate this kind of affection? I, I think there are three obstacles that I'd like to just identify that I see in myself and that I think we might see that get in the way of us running towards this kind of abundant affection. Three obstacles that keep us from displaying this kind of affection towards others. Quickly. First of all, we sometimes think that affection will limit our independence. And so we are less affectionate. We will limit our independence. Here's what I mean. When you are putting someone in your heart and displaying affection towards them, you are linking yourself to them. So let, let me just answer that concern immediately. Yes, it does. You cannot be abundantly affectionate towards someone and simultaneously completely independent from them. You can't do both. So let me just, let me just agree with that concern. That's true. But it's not a reason not to be affectionate. Because we're not called to be independent, isolated from others. We're called to be affectionately united to others. That's the way God has made us. That's the way God has called his church to be. But you might identify in yourself. Maybe you would say, if, if I allow myself to be really affectionate towards this person, loving, grateful, excited about what's happening with them, grieved when they suffer, rejoicing when God works in their life, I've, I've tied my heart to theirs. Well, you will feel that tie. I'm not as independent. I, I'm not in a place where I could be careless when they suffer or not excited when they rejoice. I'm linked to them by my affection for them. Yes, that is true. So independence is sometimes an obstacle, an idol, that gets in the way of us expressing the kind of affection that Paul has. Paul had linked his heart to the Philippians, and they had linked their heart towards him. What happened to him affected them. What happened to them affected him. He was not independent of them. Sometimes that gets in the way. I mean, you could drop that down even to a Christian marriage. Sometimes that gets in the way even of affection being displayed towards a spouse. Because if you, if you display this kind of affection and celebration and grief with them and their suffering, what happens? You are united to them in a deeper way. 
And sometimes we're tempted to want a a bit more independence. I I don't want to be as tied to what happens to you. But Paul says, this is right for me to feel towards you because you are a recipient with me of grace. And I should feel grateful towards you because you are grateful and loving towards me even in the most difficult moments. Let me encourage you to push aside that obstacle of independence. If, if, if you're someone, and often, not always, but often, this is the case frequently with guys, there's a certain craving for independence and isolation. It feels safe, it feels protected. Let, let, let me encourage you. That is not biblical masculinity. Biblical manhood is affectionate. Biblical masculinity is abundantly, joyfully grateful and affectionate towards those who are our fellow recipients of God's grace. Affection might limit our independence. Yes, it might. Let's cast that craving for independence aside. Let's link ourselves to others. Second obstacle that sometimes gets in our way. Affection might result in complacency. This is a fear I think people have. Look, if, if I'm affectionately grateful, celebrating of the grace of God in this person's life and, and how much they mean to me, that, that might result in them being complacent in some way. This happens all the time in marriage and parenting. If, if I really just unleash affection towards them and gratefulness and just celebrate how I see God's grace in them and I'm so excited for how they've, what they've meant to me and the joy we have in being in Christ together. Well, they, they might, they might like take their foot off the gas a little bit and, and, and they might kind of stop working hard to please me or to grow in some of these ways. So there can be a fear that if I'm affectionate, if I'm grateful, if I'm joyful, well, that, 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 that might cause them to, to sort of lighten up. And wouldn't it be better to kind of keep the fear of spouse in them a little bit? Wouldn't it be better to kind of keep the whip of my aloofness nipping at their heels so that they keep pushing forward to grow? Well, no, that's thinking more like a slave master than a Christian. Our distance, our anger, our correction is never meant to pressure people by fear or guilt to keep growing or keep loving us in a certain way. No, we're meant to display the same kind of love that the the Lord has towards us who loved us even when we were far away, who was gratefully affectionate and abundantly joyful towards them even when they are struggling. You notice this again and again in Paul. Paul is going to bring observations to the Philippians. It seems likely there was was some degree of conflict present in this church. Perhaps there was some arrogance that was taking place. He calls out two ladies by name later in the book who seem to be fighting, who were significant pillars in the church. And he appeals to them. Listen, this church isn't perfect. Pa- Paul's not aware of just an absence of all imperfections here. But he still is outpouring his affection and gratefulness towards them. You know, sometimes this happens with, with children. E- even children who have come to know the Lord. We can withhold affection and gratefulness towards them out of a fear that that might lead to complacency. Boy, if I really celebrate the grace of God I see in their life, boy, that, that might result in them not trying as hard. Or, or they might go complacent on me. But we're called to trust the Lord Jesus Christ with the growth of our fellow believers. Do we encourage them? Do we challenge them at times? Do we bring even correction? Yes, we do. But that should be in the context of this kind of grateful, abundant affection, the overflow of the heart that Paul is. It is right for me to feel this way about you. Not because you're perfect, not because you're godly in every instance, because you're a recipient with me of grace, and you're with me in my imprisonment, and you're with me in my defense of the gospel. You're with me in Christ, and therefore, I am just abundant in my affection towards you. 
This perspective of loving affection, of grateful devotion, must flow out of us even when and especially when we are aware of weaknesses in this fellow Christian. Final obstacle that I think gets in our way. Sometimes we think affection might limit our independence. Yes, it will. Affection might result in complacency, not in my experience, but even if it does, we are called to this. Finally, affection might lead to betrayal. That's a fear that gets in the way of this kind of abundant, overflowing affection that Paul's modeling here. Well, yeah, but if I really link myself to them, if I really give myself to loving them, I really give myself to being excited when God's grace is at work in their life and grieved when they're suffering. If I really give my heart to this person, to these people, what happens if they betray me? Won't my heart hurt worse for having given it to them? Yes, it will. Sometimes when we have fears, it's good to not pretend like those fears aren't accurate. Fears sometimes are accurate. They're just not God. They act as though we can talk about the future and just eliminate God from the equation. Is it the case that when you link your heart to someone and pour out this kind of affection, I am grateful, it is right for me to feel this way, I have you in my heart, is it the case that they could betray you and that that will hurt worse than if you never loved them in the first place? Yes, that is the case. Let's be honest about that. Yes, it is the case. And yet... A heart that refuses to love shrinks itself to the size of its own cynicism. It shrinks itself down. And you know what really it's trying to do? It's trying to live life without ever needing a fresh outpouring of the love of God. That's what cynicism really does. Relational cynicism, what it really does is it tries to say, I want to relate to people in such a way that I would never desperately need God when they betray me. I I want to relate to people in such a protected, isolated, careful, cautious, restricted way that they're never a threat such that I would have to cry out to God to sustain me and help me and keep me when they turn away from me. I don't want to need God in my relationship to people, so I won't let them in too deep where they can hurt me. But God says, no, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Love other people, and when they do let you down, I am right there with you to help you keep loving them even in that moment. And you can feel that vulnerability, can't you? Yeah, but that, that would, I would be, I'd be really needy. Lord, if I, if I give myself to this person and they let me down, that, that is going to be hard. Yes, it is. But not as hard as the cross. And in the cross, Jesus' friends betrayed him while he was in the process of loving them. At the cross, Jesus loved those who were abandoning him, those who were hating him. He loved them in that moment. He loved you in that moment. There's never been a person whose love caused them to feel more vulnerability than Jesus Christ. And that's the same Jesus whose affection is pouring out of Paul's heart. You notice that Paul says, I love you with the affection of who? Christ Jesus. Who understands better than anyone how vulnerable love can make you? Christ Jesus. Who understands more than anyone that it's hard to love people that you know are going to turn away from you? Christ Jesus. Who understands that it's hard to love someone knowing they are going to let you down? Christ Jesus. But this is the love that's meant to be poured out of the Christian. The Christ Jesus kind of love. The cross kind of love that holds to people even when they let you down and pours that same love towards them in tangible human fashion. That the love of Christ would be displayed through his church. Not in spite of betrayals and being let down, 
But precisely in those moments, because that's the kind and level of love that Jesus gave to us. Listen, if we avoid love in order to protect ourselves from betrayal, we're falling short of the love of Christ being poured out towards us. That's precisely the love we're meant to give. And the good news is, when that betrayal comes, as it has for me, and I'm sure it has for many of you, we can go back to the one who never betrays anyone and proved that by dying on the cross. If there ever was a time when Jesus was going to betray us, it would have been on the way to the cross. So here we have the friend who never betrays us, who always loves, who always cares for us, even when we let him down, and we can go to him when other friends let us down. Brothers and sisters, these are the obstacles that keep us from loving in this kind of abundant way. But we must have this love in the church because it displays the love of Christ who gave himself for us and sacrificed himself to create a body that is linked and united and one in heart with fellow believers, both here and partners around the world who are also serving the Lord Jesus Christ, like Paul was to this church. Brothers and sisters, let me encourage you. Let's take those obstacles down. Let's remove them. The craving for extreme independence, the fear of complacency, that that affection might lead to betrayal. Those are just obstacles that get in the way of this kind of open-hearted affection towards others. The willingness to look naive if they don't return that affection. The willingness to reach out when they don't reach out to you. The willingness to love even when you're treated poorly. The willingness to care even when you're not cared for. The willingness to express perhaps a naive level of enthusiasm about this person when you're not really positive that they won't struggle the very next week. This is the kind of affection that Paul pours out towards them. It's the kind of affection that we're meant to pour out. What you have heard and seen and learned and received in me. Practice these things, including the abundant affection that Paul has for them because they are fellow recipients of grace. Even in his imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, they have the most grand project in the world that they are both committed to. And because of that, Paul says, I love you. I am grateful for you. I cherish you. You are in my heart I rise with you. I fall with you. I suffer with you. You suffer with me. I love you. I am grateful for you. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all. Making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And it is right for me to feel this way about you. Because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Let me say to close, this is how your pastors also feel about you. We love you. We are grateful for the grace of God that we see in you. And this is how I know many of you feel towards each other. You love each other. We see it in the way you serve, in the way you encourage, in the way you pray for each other. You love each other. Let me encourage you. Let your love abound more and more. Let it well up to an extravagant God-witness affection and gratefulness. Let this church be full of affection that flows from an encounter with Jesus Christ, the loving Savior. Let's let grateful affection define our hearts towards one another. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we delight in you. We rejoice in your love towards us. Lord, we receive the assurance of your love that your scriptures give us because we were once dead in our sins, but now you have brought us to yourself. You have made us alive. Lord, give us grace to love 
our fellow Christians, Lord, those that are spouses, Lord, those that are children, those that are community group members, those that are, serve with us on teams, those that are friends, neighbors, Lord, help us to love with your love. We pray that you would give us the grace to love others. Cause us to do that, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.